again. Welcome to Chem Talks, online conference where scientists present advancements of their researches and give talks on the cutting edge scientific themes. Today, our speaker is Dr. Peter Yarovsky uh, from Chemalife SA, which is a company developing software driven by machine learning that allows the chemical industry to model chemistry, improve yield, and generate the new chemical leads. Let me briefly introduce our speaker. Dr. Yarovsky graduated from the New York University in 2001 where he did uh, work with uh, Professor Schuster. There he was awarded the Isazor Rubiner Award for Excellence in Chemical Research. Following his undergraduate studies, Dr. Yarovsky left New York City for Los Angeles to obtain his PhD in 2006 at the New University of California, uh, California, pardon, Los Angeles, working with Professor Howe and Professor uh, Garcia Garibay in the field of theoretical and computational chemistry. He, his work was funded in part by American Chemical Society uh, Organic Division Fellowship. After obtaining his PhD, Dr. Yarovsky quit Los Angeles for Zurich, Switzerland to do a postdoctoral stay in the laboratories of Professor Dr. Francois Diderich at the, at the ETH Zurich. At ETH, he turned to experimental synthetic and physical organic chemistry. After that, Dr. Yarovsky began his independent career in the direction of molecular and supramolecular computational and experimental design, employing the techniques of physical organic chemistry with an emphasis on optoelectronics. The strategy involved novel experimental organic synthesis and solution phase characterization in conjunction with the related and standalone computational projects. The strategy involved novel experimental organic synthesis and solution. Oh, pardon. <laughs> um, then Dr. Yarovsky left academia to co-found Chemalife SA towards the total computational prediction of any chemical reaction. The company efforts integrate Dr. Yarovsky's deep knowledge of theory with his understanding of the needs of experimental chemists to achieve the reliable predictions without the hassle of technical aspects of computational chemistry. The company now serves automated high-level quantum chemistry to a variety of chemical industrial sectors, as well as education and deploy machine learning and big data to return quantum chemistry accuracy in seconds rather than days. Uh, the QA session will be held right after the presentation and during the talk, leave your uh, questions in the chat. Dr. Yarovsky, thank you very much for coming and now the virtual scene is yours. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction. Really great to be here. Thanks for organizing this talk. I look forward to this uh, presentation. Um, thanks for those joining and uh, for those who may watch this in the future um, on YouTube. Um, as, as mentioned, my name is Peter Jarowski. Uh, I'm the director of Chemalive, which is a Lausanne-based uh, digital chemistry company that develops software as well as does contract research, uh, delivering quantum mechanical uh, projects to, to basically the whole of the chemical industry. So, um, a little overview uh, first of the talk. Um, this, this is really not an academic talk. It's more of a technology talk. There will be certainly some points of academic interest, some, uh, some areas where we've had to dive deep into the science, but then other areas where it's, it's very much engineering uh, focused. Uh, so first, a personal introduction. I think that'll be very quick. Uh, thanks to Igor's nice introduction already. Um, uh, overview of the company and its technological position, uh, then a little bit of talking about what construct is and what it does. I'll spend a lot of time talking about totemers and conformers. Uh, one time in the past, I, I told one of my colleagues I would never say the word totemer again, um, but I say it probably 10 times a week. So we'll talk about that a bunch and then uh, how we deliver quantum chemical descriptors in the context of machine learning. And then finally, at the end, my, my agenda is really to get people to use our software. So we'll talk a bit about the technical aspects of how you would actually go about doing that. <clears throat> So the, this will be real quick, you know, you've, if you were wondering why this, uh, you know, Polish guy in Switzerland speaking with a New York accent, it's because I'm a New Yorker, um, got my degree there, I won't mention it all again, yes, I went to UCLA, then went to ETH Zurich, and then the interesting part happens after getting into my professorship, then this is hysteresis because of a two body problem. So I left academia to return back to Switzerland to, to found Chemalive uh, because that was the, the easier thing to do than rather than going back and forth between England and Switzerland. So 
what uh, you know along the way uh, of course life gets more complicated and uh, there's more factors to consider um a bit about my background chemically, which is also nicely introduced. Um, I think I would summarize what I've done uh, before Chemalive really as, you know, being a thorn in the side of convention, kind of being annoying, uh, looking at um, standard models in computational chemistry and, and theoretical chemistry, as well as just physical organic chemistry, and, and using using the, the tools of computational chemistry to say, hey, you know, maybe those those models are inaccurate, um, in, incomplete, et cetera. So we've done a lot of work in the space of uh, conjugation of dions. And, um, so yeah, being a thorn in the side of convention, um, basically doing annoying things like, you know, questioning how conjugation really works. What are the values, energetic values of conjugation, looking at strange and bizarre um, resonance structures and non-calculate uh, intermolecular charge transfer, um, putting metals in, in, in the conjugation path for ICT as well, and also looking at valence bond uh, theory approaches to ICT and, and, and organic molecular optics. So uh, covering a wide range of, of, of areas of organic chemistry using computational tools. So that's where I am. If anyone wants to reach out and, and that sparks any interest, we can talk more about that. But that's, that's I think, important for you to understand my background and context chemically. So Chemalive um, is uh, in Switzerland. It's, it's, a, it's a company which is essentially digital chemistry, but our focus is quantum chemistry. Um, and the, the point of, of what we do really is, is to allow quantum chemistry to be deployed at scale for non-computational chemists or non-quantum chemist experts. Um, so that, that involves, of course, um, getting the quantum chemistry working, working at scale, so a lot of engineering. Um, in order to deliver that, you need to, to have it in a full automation context. So, you know, any chemist can do quantum mechanics as long as they have a molecule that they want to ask a, a chemical question about. Um, and then also doing something with the data that comes out of the other end. So making sure that that data is well curated, it's database, and then uh, allowing for you know processing with that data, especially in a machine learning context. So those are the kind of three things that our company position is is based on. Um, you know, uncovering what what experiment couldn't uncover. So that's what the iceberg is doing there. And then I have a little disclaimer here because. Because my, my motivation is to get people to use the software. It's commercially available. You can uh, use it in trial. You can pay for it tomorrow and, and, and use it tomorrow. Uh, it's ready to go in uh, V2. So uh, contact uh, at info for, for more information about that. So um, yeah, again, like what do you need really to, to, to scale quantum mechanics? Well, um, there are kind of four things that we've identified. Um, I won't go through every detail here. I think most, most of the audience understands that the biggest problem with quantum mechanics is that it's too damn slow uh, to really be, you know, at the scale commensurate to, and required for by, by drug discovery, for example, or any kind of discovery effort. Um, but to get there, uh, there are four things you need. And, and one of them is automation, as I mentioned. Another is getting the computation to be efficient. Um, relying on big data, so using, you know, not repeating calculations that have already been done. Um, and then also there's a machine learning aspect, so Delta ML and other approaches that, that speed up computation. Um, and our, our goal really is to get, you know, quantum mechanics used more in, in pharmaceuticals, but also everywhere in chemistry. I mean, it's particularly bad in pharmaceuticals. I think, I think quantum mechanics is used a lot more in materials design than, than in pharma, for example. But um, we can really improve this and actually eventually displace, you know, regular classical mechanics with quantum mechanics. That's the ultimate goal. So um, a lot of our motivation is based, this is kind of an old slide, but but still relevant. You know, in, in 2019, CEO of Novartis uh, made a comment in, in Forbes magazine, which kind of struck me, which was they had a, a machine learning effort going on at Novartis. And he basically comes out and says, well, we've been trying that for a while. But what people don't realize is that we simply don't have the data to learn anything from. That's that's what's happening. And at the same time, you have these huge investments in in, in machine learning in chemistry. And I wonder, you know, we still there've been some talk here and there, but we we still don't really have a molecule which has been you know developed completely by machine learning. Let's say. So the problem has always really been the the data, and this goes back almost a hundred years now. So you know, the, there there's been always a problem at least let's say since the 1950s, where getting fundamental 
data in chemistry has been a problem because there isn't really an easy way to fund doing that kind of research. So it's hard to, to actually put together data sets that, are, that you can learn from. I did this in 2017. I tried to, tried to make a database of PKAs, for example, uh, by hand at the time, and I could only get to about 5,000 data points. Um, so that, that was the, the dismal state of PKA data at that time. So we really need more data, and if we're not going to get it experimentally, we should be getting it using state-of-the-art uh, modern physics and quantum mechanics. Um, just to, you know, the, uh, the ideas are, are, our software is meant to be super easy to use for, for everybody, but maintain the accuracy of, of you know, quantum mechanics, uh, like delivered by, by Schrodinger or, or Gaussian. And I'm sort of plotting these, these programs in terms of their ease of use, uh, relative to their accuracy. And yeah, you can achieve a lot of accuracy with Gaussian, but most people who use Gaussian are going to be experts in quantum mechanics, and that takes... A PhD to get to the to the state where you can actually just use that software effectively. So we want to get rid of that barrier by by making it available more readily. Um, and of course, the golden goose for quantum mechanics is that it can allow you to do or to get data about potential experiments before you go in the lab and do them. Um, it can also uh, help to validate data you have generated experimentally, uh, fill in missing missing data that you can't get experimentally for some reason or that you just don't have the resources to get. So th that's the, the thing we're trying to achieve for experimentalists. We have four basic like verticals, if you want to call them that. Construct is the software that is the, the alpha launch software that we've developed. Um, but there are other efforts. Um, Interact is the next one, which will launch. Um, Spectra is almost completed as well. React uh, is our grand goal. That's the hardest one to, to complete. We're not really ready to launch that yet. But I just wanted to, to talk a bit about these other efforts, and then we'll return to talking about Construct, which you know is is a, a piece of software for deploying quantum mechanics on molecules at scale. So it's a it's about molecular structure which some say is about 70% of design. Um, so it's a very important uh, part to start with, uh, and that's why we started with Construct. But let's just talk a little bit about the other things we do, because they're also interesting. Um, for example, for, for this Interact software we developed, we, we have a, a protocol for exploring the three-dimensional space of dimerizations of molecules. Um, they don't have to be the same molecule. They could be homodimerizations or, or hetero. Um, we, we, we use molecular dynamics to run six um, parallelized uh, MD simulations at the same time with a, with a flat bottom full potential, full potential um, that allows us to really sample the space really nicely and, and get all the configurations, which are shown here at the right. Um, we did this uh, against the S22 benchmark and just with PM6, just with dispersion, you get a really nice correlation. We don't miss any configurations using our, our protocol. Um, so that's really nice and, and consistent. Um, we, we've also done this with, with, with a multinational corporation to look at um, binding of copper ions uh, to various binders. Um, this is just one example. Perhaps it's it's meant for the, the detergent industry. But yeah, you you could put an ion and a, and a binder in our system, and it'll it'll generate all the configurations using MD, and then follow on that with with optimization with quantum mechanics to get a good a good pose configuration. Um, we also store this data, which is kind of a technological leap in in our opinion because it's very hard to cheminformatically store um, uh, you know dimer information. It's, it's much much more easy to store molecular information, but we have a, a way to to basically get this information stored and get it being able to be retrieved easily. So you can do all kinds of different different dimer type of systems. We also have um, uh, algorithms for automatically generating color using time-dependent density functional theory. Um, this is one example we did on 500 molecules um, where we were predicting the color that we were given a very small data set of crystals that have color and then the, the border is the predicted color. Um, we hit the color pretty well in most cases. Um, this is a gray log uh, trace of, of our computations completing success successfully. Some of them are, are failing, of course. But in the end, we can automatically generate colors and we can help you sort. If you have 500 molecules and you only want red ones, 
uh, we can easily deploy that calculation and give you a list of 50 that that should be red instead of and certainly get rid of the ones that will be blue or green etc so um another one we have which is less developed in terms of you know, software but but still works is we can automatically deploy um lots and lots of potential energy surface scans of potential reactions here's an example of predicting the regio selection of a one three uh, dipole reaction uh, for producing a pyrosol compound so this is done in parallel uh, you'll, you'll get the barriers um, out of that i won't say this this is probably a next year problem to get this as a software to deploy to the community so um, let's let's get talking about constructs. So construct again is, is about molecules. Um, the idea here is you take smiles or lists of smiles. And that's it. That's the only input you need. Uh, from that, you get returned data of high quality. Um, that includes conformational analysis. I'll go through all the details of that. Totemeric analysis, including zoodomers, um, also protomers. Um, Stereoisomeric analysis that comes out of that, and also molecular descriptors and quantum you know, quantum mechanical based electronic descriptors. So this can scale on GCP. Uh, we're not using AWS anymore, um, up to 3000 core. Um, that's the, the, the number we've hit. You can probably go higher. Um, probably you can do up between 200 and 2000 molecules per minute based on, you know, the size of the molecules. We have semi-empirical methods, DFT. Um, we have a very large database of, of molecules that are pre-computed that helps speed up things. Um, like I mentioned, you input smiles, um, you can get various outputs out of that, uh, mostly JSON, so designed to work with other engineers. Um, it can be dockerized, et cetera. Um, so, you know, you put the smiles in and out of that comes a, a ready to process a file full of high quality data. Um, the, the technology works um, in the following way. Uh, we have a back end, which is essentially a Spark um, application uh, that connects to a PostgreSQL database. This is using a remote RPC API, um, which then also manages the engine, which has four stages. So there's a there's a cheminformatics stage, a molecular mechanics stage, a semi-empirical stage, and a density functional stage. This could be also other other avid post hartree fock ab initio methods, not just to, just to leave it at DFT. Um, this this whole thing you know, uses GCP spot instances uh, for the moment. It can also use uh, your own infrastructure easily connected to that through, doc through dockerization or, or some other, other method. Um, I should mention that we just launched V2. Um, we also have a front end, which is de defunct at the moment, which should be released next month uh, in V2 as well. So uh, if you find you don't want to you know, use an API using SSH, et cetera, there's also a, a SaaS front end. Uh, in a Vue.js framework uh, that's coming up as well. So that's uh, pretty much how the technology works. And, and chemically, it's uh, perhaps more interesting for the audience. Um, we start with the cheminformatics. So you, in, in, you put input a smiles. Um, that's canonicalized. Uh, it's also checked for, for mistakes and for you know salts and other things. So there's some error checking there. Um, all the enumerations are done. Um, this is, as I'll show, uh, fully user controlled. We check the database for existing molecules. So if these things have been calculated, uh, you'll benefit from that. Um, then we, we run a distance geometry uh, enumeration of the, the shapes using universal force field or, or MMFF. Um, we can also run an MD simulation if, if the molecule is quite large and distance geometry is no longer really appropriate. Um, we removed uh, we remove you know identical uh, confirmations that come out of that. We remove very highly strained structures or otherwise malformed structures. Um, then we cluster everything using a Kopsha based RMSD cluster, so similar to what Chromos uh, Chromax uses. So we out of it you don't actually get confirmations; you get clusters, which are sort of reduced in information, but but there are less of them, so that makes it more amenable to quantum mechanics. So then we pass our clusters to semi-empirical refinement, um, where we get our first ab initio, uh, if you well, call it semi-empirical result, quantum mechanical result. Um, we check for bond changes. So if any of the bonds are broken, uh, that usually happens when you have a protomeric state, for example. Uh, we try to fix it. If not, we, we mark it as unstable. Look for negative frequencies. So they're all the structures are minima. And then we, we pass that on to 
further quantum mechanical calculations. You'll see what those are, mostly single points, um, but also geometry, optimization, frequency analysis, uh, et cetera. So that's pretty much how that, that works. And here are the user controls for the, the cheminformatics stage. Um, you have full control over what you're calculating. So if you put in a smiles and all you care about is getting one, one conf conformer of that, that smiles in, in this you know, entered totemeric form, you can do that. You turn off the, all these options and you get one result coming back. Um, if you want to enumerate the totemers or the confirmations, you can do that individually. Um, you can do everything as well. So you could also get insane results like where one molecule is becoming 200 different, different calculations. Um, so this is a lot of power that you have over the system. If you just go and select uh, yes for all of these options and go here, you'll, you'll be waiting a long time for those simulations to finish. Um, so you have to think about what you actually want to achieve with the calculations, but it's under your control. Um, now I'm talking about totemers again, and as I said, I wouldn't say totemer anymore. Um, the reason is because it's so fundamentally important. We, we started out as quantum mechanics uh, experts, let's say, and we ended up having to be cheminformatics experts for a while, and then now we've returned uh, to, uh, to quantum. So basically, here's the definition of a totemer. Uh, most people should know what that is. The point is, is that if you use most standard libraries for enumerating totemers, they don't really work for bond uh, isomerization and other kinds of more exotic totemerizations. Why? Because they're really bio-oriented. They're kind of meant for, for medchem. Um, these, kinds of, these kinds of changes are really important for, for synthetic chemistry, for example. So the, we had to think and, and kind of redesign the totemerization aspect uh, to get it to work for, for everybody, including uh, chemists who are looking to optimize reactions, for example. So we, we, we did that. Um, and one example we had was we looked at simple and, and very important molecule, uracil. Um, if, you, uh, if you put uracil into open babel, you'll get four totemers. If you do that with cactus, you'll get seven. Um, if you do it with our two totemers algorithm, you'll get eight. So what's happening here? Well, open babel does first generation totemers. So it does the totemers of the input. Uh, cactus does second generation totemers. So it does the totemers of totemers which gives you a few more uh, totemers out of that. We, we don't have a limit really. We do totemers of totemers of totemers and until, until there are no more totemers that are being uh, enumerated. Uh, so we end up picking up this, this one extra structure at the end. In addition to getting more of the structures and being more robust about it, um, we also of course have the overlay of, of PM6 and DFT and other kinds of quantum mechanical applications. So you actually get the good quality energy of those, those totemers at the end of the calculation. Um, so basically our, our system really relies on, on very few rules and, and the rules are, I think I mentioned them up here, um, but we, we really don't have any preconceived notion about what a totemer is. We just enumerate everything and then let the quantum mechanical result of the energy tell us which, which ones are important, which ones are not. Um, we did this on the total base, which is a reference down here for that. So total base is a set of about 1681 totemeric pairs. Um, after some filtering for, for things we could actually manage organic uh, with log K, et cetera, et cetera, we had about five, four or 500 individual pairs. And um, what we were able to do is fully match all of those. If you try to try to use a standard enumerator, uh, the vast majority of these will never get the, the match of the, the input totemer, will never generate the, the other totemer in the totem base that corresponds to the one that's experimentally known because most of them are bond isomerizations and other things that, that aren't picked up. So we were able to fix that problem and then we could show without, without too much benchmarking or other the other work, you had a very nice correlation in solution uh, using, you know, standard B3 lib um, on that. So you can get very accurate numbers for, for totemers in solution, uh, and deploy them with a single list and get, get the full result uh, in, in a matter of a few hours. Um, one of the things that's dogged and hound us, hounded us since the very beginning is, is, is the Inky. If there's anyone listening who's part of the Inky Trust, I apologize. I just don't like Inkies. Um, the reason I don't like them is because they tell us um, 
what a totemer is and not instead of letting us decide what it is. So what, what happens with an inky is if you take a structure like this, it'll generate the inky. The inky will define these five totemers, but any one of these five totemers won't produce the input totemer back. So there's a one to end mapping, which is broken because inky decides that these are totemers of this molecule. And this one, for some reason, is not a, a, an appropriate totemer. Um, so we've solved that problem uh, after a lot of painstaking work by basically getting rid of a, a kind of chemical intuition about what these things are. What happens basically in our system is you define a molecule, we enumerate it. If any of the structures which are enumerated belong to an existing molecule that, that happens, it happens if you have that as a subset structure, then those two molecules get merged into one substance down here. And every time you ping our, our database, if, if any one of your, your molecules is in this, in this set, then that's the substance you're working with. Um, so we don't, I'm not in a talk. Oh, okay. Bye. <laughs> Sorry, someone's coming in the room. Um, so the, um, th that's how we deal with this problem. Uh, and now you can, you can never have a pro uh, the issue of, of not getting back the information you put in the system. Um, Again, here's an example of sort of how these things happen. Probably don't need to go through all those details, but we, we resonate and deprotonate until everything is generated. Um, we also store all the confirmations and, and et cetera in a database. This is sort of a snapshot of that database architecture. So you have totemers. Um, totemers generate stereoisomers. So they're all you know connected to the totemer in the database in a hierarchical um, sense so there's there's no loss of information about what connects to what each stereoisomer whether whether it be a, a real chiral molecule or a chiral doesn't matter um connects to a bunch of confirmations um there's a lot of work being done in the background you know dealing with the loss of chirality dealing with the fact that um there's there's not a one-to-one -one mapping of, of confirmations going from mechanics to quantum mechanics you, you lose a lot of confirmations actually i'll talk about that in a few slides so then also the, the fact that sometimes there are spurious uh, reactions, some, some structures are unstable, the database deals with all that. Okay, so how did we validate all this? So we, we, we had about three and a half million molecules in our database at the time we made these, these images. Um, we were using universal force field. So we first wanted to know how does the universal force field do? Well, what we did was we took um, 40,000 structures from the the open data crystallographic open database and we compared the crystal structure that we extracted from those the molecular structure that we extracted from the crystal structures to the computed uff structure and what's kind of amazing here is that not maybe really amazing but uff gets the crystal structure you know 99 percent of the time um, which is actually not amazing because that's kind of how it was designed. It was designed to, to, to reproduce crystal structures. So it does a very good job doing that. If you want to get the crystal structure, you can use universal force field. You don't need quantum mechanics. It'll, it'll produce that structure. Um, the problem happens is when you go off equilibrium. So we compared, and that's on the next slide. So we compared this um, to our PM6, and PM6 pretty much does, does a good job as well. It, it predicts the 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 lowest energy structure. Um, then we, we looked at all the confirmations and their relative energies um, uh, using 68 million confirmations from universal force field and 35 million confirmations from PM6. Um, did a lot of analysis. The, the, the distribution of confirmations is actually much tighter with PM6 than, than universal force field, um, which tails out quite a lot. So there's, there's some interesting things to say about that, um, which I won't won't do right now. Uh, then we we also wanted to know, well, how does PM6 compare to universal force field? And how does PM6 compare to DFT, let's say, or some, some DFT method? We didn't actually have to solve that, that or answer that question because it was answered already by two papers. Um, one, uh, one talks about the, the good agreement between PM6 and uh, B3LIP. I believe it was B3LIP or some, some DFT method. Um, where PM6 collects about 60% more accuracy relative to, to mechanics-based methods. Then there's another very large study done uh, looking at the incredible accuracy of PM6 relative, uh, for 
structural prediction, bond lengths, angles, et cetera, uh, relative uh, to um, TFT as well. So we know that PM6 is a good intermediary method between classical mechanics and, and ab initio uh, quantum mechanics. What we're showing here is that actually, if you take universal force fields results, as you move away from the, the equilibrated crystal structure and you start to get higher energy conformations, the, ener the, the energy difference or the, the relative energy difference compared to PM6 starts to explode and, and reaches about 200%. Um, so if you're off equilibrium just a little bit, your, your classical mechanics force field will not know what the energy of that structure is, but PM6 will. So that's really good to know. Um, we applied some of these concepts to, to a kind of fake uh, drug discovery program where we, we had a, a, tri a pyrazole based drug. This is actually a real substructure of a real drug. Um, and then we worked with ChemSpace to, to enumerate a, a library based on uh, synthetic feasibility. So we're using actually a, a one, three dipolar reaction uh, that splits the, the molecule here. Um, so looking at uh, one three one three dions and et cetera that, that are as a, as a as a molecular synthon. So we generated a database of eighteen hundred pyrazole molecules that could be made easily at high yield tomorrow, just based on ordering chemicals from various uh, databases. Um, and what we found is kind of cool. Like uh, my wife's a neuroscientist; she always says this looks like a brain. It kind of does. Um, what what this is is a universal force field results for that eighteen hundred uh, molecule library. There are about 400,000 confirmations in this graph. And what we're looking at is the RMSD of those confirmations relative to a, a standard uh, structure, which we're calling uh, the, the active structure, um, and the, the relative uh, confirmation of strain energy. What you have kind of this is this blob, which is not very interpretable. When you move to PM6, you, you automatically get this kind of four quadrant result. Uh, and this this actually represents about 300,000 uh, data points. So you, you lose about 25% of your data points that they've collapsed. They've become the same confirmation because PM6 is more discerning. It takes the UFF structure as input and then finds out that actually two confirmations are the same confirmation. Um, and these these four quadrants are, are chemically meaningful. This, this is actually a rotation around a specific bond creating two different quadrants and then a rotation around a different bond creating these two different lines. So what you can actually see is this is an overlay of one molecule out of that database or out of that data set. And in, in the one with PM6, there's a hole here. So you can actually see that hole, which is corresponding to this, this band of empty data. Whereas in here, there's, there's no hole because there's a smear of data. So it's a visual, visual uh, proof that PM6 is a more discerning method and it's actually very useful for uh, getting results quickly. Um, now, the machine learning part, um, there are two basically, two machine learning uh, aspects in, in, in quantum chemistry, right? There's delta ML, which is an effort to basically supplant the need for quantum mechanics. So can we learn uh, the difference between a cheap method and an mm -hmm. expensive method and then never have to do the expensive method again? We're not gonna be talking about that today. Um, Google put out a paper about that last year is, is quite the big thing. Um, they're moving along with that kind of that kind of work. Um, what we're really talking about here today is quantum informed uh, machine learning. So putting quantum mechanical results into uh, as, as features in, in the machine learning paradigm. So along with cheminformatics and other experimental values, et cetera, uh, what kinds of electronic descriptors can be put in there to, to make the, the prediction more accurate. Um, and this, is, of course, is a, a pretty hot field. There's a lot going on. I just have a few papers uh, that I've pulled that I think are interesting. There are plenty more that you could find. This is um, a paper uh, by Connor Conley uh, about um, using uh, QM-based uh, atom and bond-centered uh, uh, features, basically at atomic charges and, and bond lengths, et cetera, to train a, a model uh, to predict reactivity. Um, so with a great effect, so you can, you can just take some, some basic quantum mechanical features from coming from the wave function and vastly improve the pr prediction in this case. So you can go to the paper and read about that yourself. Um, here's another example um, where they're looking at uh, solubility, where they're using uh, 
some some electronic descriptors like atomization energy, quadrupole moment, hardness, electronegativity, which are also available through our software, and getting results where they can they can really train their their models very well and converge them very very easily. So you can check out that paper at this link as well. Um, then there's a, another one which I thought was quite interesting, uh, where they they have a did a nice nice effort of making a, a large data set uh, of about uh, 655,000 drug like molecules, which have been all computed with quantum mechanics. And the, the, the basic motivation for this this project um, is to provide a data set open that can be used to then train machine learning. Algorithms. So this is really a field moving forward, um, and it's very important. So how would you use Construct uh, to generate similar data uh, for your own uh, research? Okay. So first of all, you need to know for this version of the API, you, you need to know how to you know log into an SSH terminal. If you don't know how to do that or don't want to do that, um, then you can wait till next month, and we'll relaunch the the SAS. In which case, you can just do all the stuff. Uh, through the web as well. But if you're comfortable doing uh, doing terminal work, let's say you start with um, some, I think this is a, a MOL2 format. I'm not sure, I forget. I don't use this one very often. Uh, but you start with some format, could be XYZ, could be, could be MOL2, PDB, uh, SDF. You're gonna wanna turn that into smiles, right? Um, sometimes there's some metadata attached, uh, like, like the output of Open Babel. So you're gonna need to then do a little bit of bash work to so cut T, you know, cut D and get get the smiles. So, once you have a list of of smiles uh, in in this sort of very simple format, you're ready to use our software. Um, the way you do that is really two ways, um, which are essentially the same way. Uh, we have uh, Python scripts that that help to wrap our software, uh, at least to help this the submission part. You can reach out to us, and we'll provide you those those Python scripts that you can then use and modify as you need. Um, so basically, you you put your smiles or your list of smiles um, in there. There are options, whoops, um, and then you have to specify what what kind of computation you want to do. I have a, the next slide tells you what that means. Um, you're basically either going to submit a calculation, which you know the API will return only the status. It'll say it doesn't exist yet. It's got, it's running. It exists already. It failed recently. Um, so that's not the result you want. You want to wait till that that result comes back as exists, and then you can use API read with the options with your procedure, and then you'll get your data back. Right. So you have to submit it, then you read it. Um, underneath that is essentially a curl command. So inside that script, you you could also avoid that script entirely. You can use bash if you want. Uh, execute a curl. You're gonna basically use a method. This is a JSON RPC API, so it's not a RESTful API. Don't get confused there. Um, that means that it's, it's actually better and more more efficient, but that's a different discussion. Um, if you want to do it this way, you'll need an API key. Reach out info at chemalive.com. We'll give you one. Um, you put your smiles in again to find to find the method you're interested in, your options, etc. You'll submit, you'll get back a result about the status. If it exists, then you can then go ahead and read it. So really simple. Um, you can do this today as long as you have an SSH terminal and an API key. So reach out for that. Um, in terms of the available methodologies, um, we have uh, uh, basically this, this hierarchy of stages and it's kind of the conceptual way we approach this. Um, so stage zero is cheminformatics. So if you if you choose stage zero, you're basically gonna, your procedure is basically going to be CI. You're just going to get back enumerated smiles that you, that you were interested in. Um, stage one is mechanics. Uh, you can put in procedures like UFF or MMFF. I think MF, MMFF is not working at the moment, so UFF is the one to choose. Um, these are internal stages that that you don't have to worry about that that aren't really accessible. Um, but then you get to stage four, so you're going to put in UFF, so the, the preceding calculation, then PM6. So you're doing a PM6 calculation on a UFF structure. Um, after that, you, it goes on in that fashion, UFF, PM6, B3LIPSP, so a single point B3LIP calculation, or with dispersion or in water, so you, you get the idea. You can 
try those different things. Of course, there's an API documentation. There's a link at the last slide. You can download that. It has more details about that. Um, then there's stage six, seven, and eight. So after a single point, you can optimize the structure. You can then uh, do a single point on the optimized structure. And then finally, you can do a frequency correction uh, on that optimized structure. So they're, they're arranged from stage zero to eight. And you don't actually care what the stage is. You care what the name of the procedure is. Um, if you put this in as the procedure, then you'll get to stage eight. So that's how that, that works. Um, the properties you get back from the calculation, um, of course, you get a battery of 3D descriptors that you would get from RDKit. These are all coming from RDKit. Um, the difference is that you're not getting a 3D descriptor on a molecular mechanics result. You're getting a 3D descriptor on a quantum mechanical result. Um, we've had a number of projects doing this. They can be quite different, right? So you do get an improvement in in things in some of these features like asphericity, et cetera, eccentricity. Uh, there'll be differences uh, going going to a quantum mechanics regime. Um, then you get the electronic descriptors, which you know, if you were doing classical mechanics, you've never had access to. Um, energy, obviously, different thermal corrections, your charge, your dipole magnitude, the, the homo-luma gap, which is something to do with the softness, homo energy, lumo energy, Fermi, et cetera. Uh, then you get some of the these numbers from the, the wave function, core core revulsion. These these values actually can be used as features. I don't, you know, I don't pretend to understand how the core core repulsion would ever inform any machine learning algorithm that about something about the, the molecule and its properties, but there are a number of papers which suggest that these things do help uh, help train the data sets. So um, then finally, there's some advanced properties, uh, molecular dipole. Uh, you get a list of all the orbitals as a list of tuples. You can get uh, infrared uh, spectroscopy as a list of tuples, NMR tensors as a list, um, 3D structures, of course. You get the 3D structure. That's that's obvious. Um, you can also do uh, time-dependent density functional theory. You'll get a list of tuples. That's you know the, the energy and intensity of the transition, heat of formation, if you're doing uh, semi-empirical calculation. So you get you know all these different values that are coming back in a JSON format. Uh, that can be post-processed. Um, just a simple example, just to give a little bit more clarity. Here's a uracil mustard. I, I chose uracil mustard instead of uracil because it's a little bit more interesting confirmationally. Um, you could do API submit with that smiles. In 51 seconds, you'll get one molecule back. That's the, the confirmation at PM6. So remember, it's gone through all these chemical stages, all the molecular mechanics uh, work, RMSD, filtering, et cetera, and it comes back. And the actual PM6 calculation is probably about 20 seconds for this molecule. Um, you could then also submit the same thing with all totemers. You'll get uh, the totemeric energies back. This is a, a graph di you know, diagram of those energies, uh, free energies actually, um, of the different totemers, which are listed here. So now you have a, a, a nice dis, you know, distribution of totemers with, with accurate, pretty, you know, fairly accurate energies that tell you that really this molecule only has one interesting totemer from a you know, room temperature point of view. Um, then you can, you can submit again dash T for totemers and dash C for all confirmations. So now you're doing quite a lot of calculations, about 32 different confirmations are included in that set. Um, I show here the difference between UFF and PM6 and diagram. So there's quite a difference between between these levels. Um, I'm, and I'm also giving the first eight confirmations that come out of that. So you could, of course, extend this further. You could ask for all the protomers. You could ask for all the zootomers. Um, and yeah, we're going to end up, you know, if you do all the protomers, that's going to probably double uh, all the zootomers. That's quite a lot as well. So you end up with 100 confirmations being, being calculated. Well, not 100, be more like two or 300 different confirmations being calculated. Okay, so that, that's how to use the construct. Um, please reach out. I mean, obviously it's probably not enough to just go ahead and do it. You wanna, you want the API key. You might wanna discuss what exactly you wanna do. Uh, we're here to do that. Happy to have a conversation about that. We have to thank all the support we've gotten in Switzerland and elsewhere uh, to develop our, our software and our company. Um, please reach out again at, at these, these addresses. And if you're interested in, in doing some homework on your own, I would suggest going to the, the Construct Docs page where there's quite a detailed uh, docs to download. Um, here there's more information. It's sort of more 
you know, startup e corporate information, just high level stuff about what the what construct does, um, et cetera, and then our, our corporate website. So I, I highly recommend you you look at the docs as well and, and reach out if you have any questions. And thanks for your time and thanks for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. So I leave I leave the presentation open. Thank you, Peter, for presentation. And now this is, this is the time for the QA session. We have a bunch of questions in the chat, and uh, I will, in the end, ask you several questions from my side. Um, cool. So the first question is, Dr. Yorovsky, thank you for this presentation. I have a question. Which QM engine do you use? Or if you do, if you do not, did you implement everything from scratch? OK. Um, so we use a bunch of softwares. We did not re, uh, reinvent quantum mechanics, thank God. Um, the chem informatics are basically a combination uh, wherever the strengths lie of OpenBabel and RDKit. The um, semi-empirical is all CP2K. Uh, yeah, all CP2K. The um, quantum mechanics is NW Chem or CP2K. And the molecular dynamics is Gromax. So th those are the softwares that we use. The, the, the implementation from scratch is the wrappers and the logic around deploying those calculations in the correct way and, and getting the data back and storing it, et cetera. Thank you. The next question is, um, it is was also, also partially uh, answered during uh, the talk. So do you have any semi-empirical methods implemented? <laughs> yep. <laughs> so we can do anything uh, CP2K can do. Um, so that includes things like PM3. Why would you do that? PM6. Um, it includes uh, PM7. Uh, we also have um, tight binding methods that, that, are, that, that can be deployed with CP2K. So I think that's a, a very interesting one for, for chemists. So, so tight binding is available. Um, it was a bit harder to implement, uh, but yeah, we, we did that last year. So you can you can deploy type binding. I don't know if I put it in the procedures. I'd have to look um, if it's there. If you want to do that, reach out and I'll I'll tell you what what the procedure name is. Um, the next question is rather interesting. So, is DLP no couple cluster singles doubles implemented? <laughs> um, do you want to pay for that? <laughs> so. Of course, anything NWCAM can do, we can do. Um, we also work uh, with, with with other softwares, um, but but basically, you know, thinking about CP2K NWCAM, you have I would say eighty percent of everything you could possibly want to do with those two softwares. Um, there's some weird things that you can't do. You might need Gaussian for. We we of course can't deploy Gaussian in this format, so that's that's off limits. Uh, but yeah, if you want to do if you want to do um, couple cluster or something like that, uh, it's possible. Just consider that, uh, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be computationally expensive. Um, but we have a talk about that on the side about what you want to achieve and, and then we can implement it for you. Thank you. And next one uh, is, I have one more question, please. Which implicit salvation models are available and which one you recommend to use? Okay, so CP2K does not have salvation for semi-empirical, unfortunately. It's a very sad thing. I almost spent a whole evening trying to just implement it by scratch or from scratch unsuccessfully. Um, when you get to the, to the post hartree fock ab initio uh, calculations, you have um, SMD and PCM. And you can have that in, in whatever solvent you want, um, even some even some special solvents which we've implemented. So those are those are the the available methods, which are what what you have for for NW Chem. Thank you for the answers. And uh, now I have several questions. Uh, as long as we don't have any questions more in the chat, um, meanwhile you can post some questions if you have. And I will ask mine now. <laughs> so the first one is about uh, PM6. Uh, uh, during the whole presentation, it popped up several times. And the question is, why did you like especially this method? Why do you have to rely on it? And why didn't you choose, for example, I don't know, 
uh, XDB, for example, or r 2 scan 3 c or any other same empirical methods available and more modern ones compared to PM6? Well, I mean, the, the goal here is not really to do some empirical calculation, right? So the goal is to get to, to ab initio. Um, the the semi-empirical level is is more of a you know, transitory way station along along the way. It's a, it's a way to sort of start the DFT or whatever you're doing with a good initial guess. If you look at PM6, PM6 can handle every atom. Um, it does an incredible job bond lengths and bond angles relative to DFT. You, you can look at the reference in the presentation. They studied 200 million uh, structures in that in that pres uh, that that paper um, with you know average difference of bond angle of like I don't remember it's like three degrees or something the the torsional angles are different by up to you know eight degrees or something like that um, I mean if you just want a a good chemical structure 3D chemical structure PM6 does the job it fails sometimes it still can't do um, you know, tertiary amines for some reason. I don't know why. It, it always thinks that if you if you have an aromatic amine, PM6 will always think that it's a tetrahedral. <laughs> Who knows why? Uh, but that gets fixed, you know, later with with the DFT if you want. So so there's whatever problems it has can be can be smoothed over later on. Um, type binding has a higher cost. Um, you know, so PM7. Uh, was, is probably something we should move up to, but but it I don't think the you know we have a big database of PM six. If we go to PM seven, then we have to start over again. And so that those are the answers. <laughs> thanks, thanks. And uh, the next one is about uh, the settings. So um, in your presentation, you say that you predict a lot of conformers and you cluster them and so on. Uh, I guess you. You are considering temperature like the room temperature, 25 degrees. Is it possible to increase the temperature and consider higher line conformations? Um, in the clustering or just in the in the enumerations? In the enumerations. Well, so distance geometry doesn't is is temperatureless. I mean, it just it just randomizes torsions basically. So you'll get. So <laughs> here's here's a funny story. I, I like your question. Um, I have a lot of funny stories, but. Um, the, the original implementation from RD kit basically takes the number of atoms and multiplies by a factor. And that's the number of confirmations generated. Now, if you're talking about naphthalene, um, it has one confirmation, but a lot more atoms than benzene. So this is kind of stupid. So we, we redesigned it so that it takes the number of uh, rotational bond or rotationable bonds or rotational bonds, uh, and then multiplies that by a factor, I think 20 or 25. So if you have a very flexible molecule, you'll get a lot of enumerated confirmations. Uh, we've tested this on a lot of molecules, millions, um, including looking at crystal structure prediction, et cetera. So we know that our settings do a good job of sampling space. You'll get certainly the, the most important confirmations. You might miss one or two every once in a while. Um, what we didn't want was to have a fully robust confirmational enumerator, which produced like hundreds of confirmations which are essentially the same structure because then you pass that to a qm regime and now you're doing lots of computationally expensive calculations and learning nothing so we cluster them to to avoid that so it, so even something flexible if the structures which are made are all kind of the same you'll end up with one cluster out of that using the the cops rmsd approach um for the md you can certainly increase the temperature so we have it running at 800 Kelvin. If you really want to go up to 1500 Kelvin or something to access more, more structures, you can do that. I think it would be about 30 minutes of work to make that a parameter if it isn't already. Thank you. And the last question about is about dispersion. So uh, which dispersion corrections are there and uh, how well do they perform? So do, do you consider implementing some new ones which come out or yeah i mean so d3 is the one which is available for pm6 um d3 d4 are available from nw chem i believe so nw chem i think it's version 6.5 uh 
has that. Uh, whatever they're doing, you know, we can do. So I, I, we're not in the business of, you know, bespoke Im implementation of dispersion corrections. We're kind of relying on uh, NWCAM. We, al we also will be working with Quantum Futures. I don't know if you've heard about them. They might be interesting, by the way, to ask, ask Laszlo if he wants to come and give a talk. That's my suggestion. Um, he's doing a lot of work with dispersion and we have, we're gonna be deploying his software which is a new, very fast quantum mechanics uh, package. So there'll be other other dispersion available, but right now it's D3, D4. Thank you, Peter. And just one last question from my side. Um, is this, uh, is Construct QT or Construct, <laughs> just simply, uh, is it available, uh, per subscription for researchers? I mean, not for the private companies, but for research institutions, research groups, uh, PhD students, and so on, or it is free for them, maybe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, right now, it's it's if you're doing PM6 work or doing some empirical work, it's we can certainly make it freely available for the right kind of interaction. Um, it has been freely available on, on the SAS in the past, so that's not going to change. Um, but from from a, if you're if you're a corporation and you want the thing is like unlike a lot of chemical softwares out there like ELNs and other things, there's a huge computational cost to running these calculations. Um, so even in our in our licensing model, we we include basically a certain amount of computation in the price. So the price for our software is not all going directly to into our pockets. A lot of it's going to Google. <laughs> so. Um, we can't just open it up and you know what happens when you open up a software to the public is within the first five minutes someone comes and abuses it as a joke i mean the first when i first when we first launched the first SAS, the first time we were able to draw molecules on the web and run a, a simulation someone came in and made web art and they drew a face with carbon atoms and nitrogen atoms and then they pushed submit and it failed so we can't just open up this kind of powerful software to everyone to do whatever they want because someone will inevitably come and put in a million molecules and, and push go. And that's that's that can't happen. <laughs> I see. Um, okay, I will finally check the chat. No more, uh, no more questions. Um, Peter, thank you very much for coming. It was a pleasure to host your talk. Thank you um, very much. So have a nice day. Thank you very much for coming and yep. see you. Thank you for listening, everyone. Have a good evening.